Hi everyone, uh, good to see you all here. We're going to, I'm going to spend half an hour discussing scalability from a, a different perspective, I think, than many of the other speakers. What, what we're trying to do in MainSafe is look at what's currently available and is it really scalable? So some, some initial thoughts. There's only four slides, so. Computers break. They generally take our data with them. Data gets lost. Is, is, that, is that better? Can you hear me okay at the back? Encryption is very complex. Remote access is extremely difficult. And syncing between devices, syncing data between our phone and our computer and any other equipment doesn't work particularly well, so I may say if we wonder why would you want to scale this? Then we've got some basic questions. When a computer breaks, why should it affect you so badly? Why is it not like your TV or toaster? You just get another one. Why is your data stationary? It's all in one place, so that thing goes down, it takes it with it, or it's on a server, the whole thing's gone. And what is it about ants that scale so well? This is this ant thing. Asynchronous network transport system. No, it's uh, actually ants. There's a, <laughs> there's a great TED video by Deborah Gordon of Stanford University who spent 20 years looking at ants and it's very worth uh, looking at. The thing about an ant colony, which is very interesting, it, it works with no central control. It's very, very scalable. The ants themselves are not particularly intelligent beasts on their own, but they don't, they don't have to be. They don't know each other's names. They don't know each other's identity. They work by basically seeing patterns. So there's four types of ants. There's work, uh, worker ants, foragers, etc. So as an ant's coming out of the, the colony, it may decide Today, I'm going to be a forager. That's what I was yesterday. And it brushes by maybe several ants who are, they've been cleaning a nest. So by the scent and noticing a different pattern, the ant adjusts what it's doing for that day. So the interesting things about ants is they do follow a few simple rules. Alone, they're not particularly effective. They could be eaten, washed away in rain or whatever. I find this part very interesting. After an ant colony reaches a certain size, it becomes very complex and capable. Different from what happens in IT, we, we tend to assume that all the parts of IT should assimilate a, a human brain. And it's, it's not effective. So ants follow a few simple rules. It's very, very critical. And made safe makes use of this thinking. So in Made Safe, we have nodes. You might not be able to read this at the top, but these are our ants. And they follow a few rules, a bit like the Asimov rules, except for, for data and scalability. The first thing is everyone must protect the colony or the network. Resources must be protected. In our case, it's, it's data. It could be many other things. And from a security perspective, we do something quite interesting. We give any data to anyone that asks for it at any time. I'm a, a great believer in designing something correctly to begin with, I think, yeah. It's, it's a very different way of looking at IT, but the likes of uh, Vint Cerf and Robert Kahn, when they came up with TCP IP packet switched information, they were laughed at by the community. Engineers everywhere thought that internet will never take off. Yeah, they were wrong. So sometimes you have to be able to look at what you understand from first principles and really question it. The fourth rule protects self. The ant protects its, itself. But an ant will never protect itself if it affects any of the other rules. It, it won't distribute resources if it's going to cause damage to them. It won't protect a resource above the colony. So if, if it's got a, a node, for instance, with a 
a piece of data which is a virus or an ant with a piece of food which is poison. Don't, don't keep it, get rid of it. And the bottom, the bottom part is very interesting. All their actions are immediate and repeatable. So if an ant finds another ant has got a virus or a, a problem, it pushes it away, it's out of the colony. If it comes back, it pushes it away again. This, this happens continually. They don't remember, oh, that's Joe, he's not a nice guy. So, so ants work on immediacy and repeatability. So that's, that's the slides. Um, what we'll do is we'll go over on the whiteboard here. Two things, we'll, we'll show you what the nodes are in our situation and what, what we do with data to begin with. There's, there's four or five parts to the MadeSafe network, which is on their own, they're quite simple, but when you connect them all together, they become very effective. So the first thing is an encryption technique where we'll take a file and split that into multiple chunks. So C1, C2, and C3. With each of these chunks, we take the hash. and save it in a file. The chunks then go through an obfuscation technique where bytes are basically swapped between all the, all the chunks. How it's done is we take an XOR packet and XOR all the way through. Then we end up with C1, C2, C3, X, they've all been. That piece of data now is without the other one is of no use. So then what we do is we we actually take the the hash of C1 plus one C2. So we take the hash of this H C2 and we encrypt this with AES two five six because it's C1, X, E, and so on, C2, X, E. And then we take the hash of this again, and we, we store that H, C1, X, E, H, C, E, X, E. This small file is called a data map. It's just a representation of the hash pre and post encryption. The important things here are any chunk here is useless, even given the encryption key. It's XOR data, it's of no use to anyone. So without your data map, you can't recreate this file at all. The other important thing to understand, oh, get some water. Cheers. The other important thing to understand here is all the data is created from the file itself. There's no, no user input. So that's fine, we can, turn, we can turn files into a mishmash of chunks and create this data map. These chunks here are actually renamed with the hash of the, the content. So those chunks are, are named bit that way and then stored somewhere. We do this with every file in the file system, so we have a data map for each file concatenated to become your data atlas. The data atlas obviously is quite a, a large file. If you take this instance, we use SHA 512, so 3K. 3K times however many files you've got. <coughs> Excuse me. So the data atlas itself becomes a file and goes through this process again. 
So what you end up with is a data map of our data atlas, data map of your data atlas. So given a data map of your data atlas like this, you can retrieve the chunks that make up your data atlas itself. Your data atlas allows you to retrieve all the chunks which make up your file system. So we call this self-encryption. And that's the first part of the system. So we'll move on from that. Yeah, yeah. The key comes from the hash of the pre-encryption chunk. So you end, you end up with the, when you break the file up, you've got C1, which is just part of the file. It's actually XOR with some random data. <laughs> XOR is an incredibly good uh, process of obfuscating information. If you take two, two pieces of information and XOR them, and take one of them away, this, this one here is very, very difficult to recreate. You can't, it's not a, an algorithm like AES that you can uh, reverse or brute force. So. so the encryption key comes from the pre-encryption chunks. It's basically a self-encrypted file. The, the second part, yeah, yeah, go. Cool. Oh, sorry. The data, is, the data map is stored well, I'll go through the authentication system, which will explain that. It's a kind of bizarre way to work. But the, the data itself we store on a distributed network. Just like at the moment, it's Kademlia. So in our system, each node, as in a, a traditional DHTE, you've got, we use 512-bit addressing as well. So every node has its own address. The, the chunk itself, at the end of the process, your C1XE. Uh, so the hash of C1XE gives you a key, which you store on the DHT. We go slightly further. What, what we've got is you've got the internet. And on top of that, you've got DHT layer. And on top of that, we have the made safe layer, where we have some of the logic, which we'll go through now. For the time being, if you just imagine that the, the data stored on a DHT, as you would do normally. On the client side of the system, there's three parameters. Your username, pin number and password. So, the client side is, is us, the human. Our nodes, I'll explain in a second. That's the ants. They're the important guys. So from, from the client side, if we take a hash of your username plus pin, sorry, can everyone here see okay when I'm right-handed? The hash of your username plus pin would give you a key. And that key we retrieve from DHT a value. That value happens to be a, a, a random ID. It's, we call it red random ID. Then the system takes the hash, username plus pin. It's actually slightly more complex than this, but given the time. We take the hash of that again. That gives us another key, and it retrieves a value. The value here is basically AES encrypted data atlas, which is the, the data atlas you just asked about. We call it TMID. It's T 
TMID for temporary ID. This changes every time someone does a session update. This random ID here changes. So your, your username, PIN, and password's never transmitted. But what it does, it allows you on a, a, just a distributed network to log in to your own data. There's no third party involved here. So that's the that's authentication system. But we're still only a very short way through the, through the network. So that's all very good. You can now encrypt a file and authentic, encrypt all your files and authenticate against your own data. So if we look at what kind of data you can actually have, you've obviously got your files. As I say, I'll go through the nodes in a minute because everybody will be thinking machines crash, they fall over, all of it. The, the nodes take care of that like ants. So what kind of data can we actually create now? Well, because you're logged in, you have, you have an identity. We use uh, RSA and generate key pairs. So if we go back to what the data was, a chunk of data is renamed with the hash of the chunk content. Okay, so anyone storing this piece of data can easily hash the content and see if it matches a key, if it's been damaged or whatever. Or even if it's not transmitted properly, we use UDP, so it's another check. <laughs> if we generate a key pair, because one of the other interesting things just now is if I send you an email or a file, how do you know it's actually me that sent it? And we can use uh, PKI, which turns out to be a bit of a nightmare because we have to go back to have some kind of centralized control or, or whatever, a, a server, a key server. So if we generate a key pair, your public and private key, and what we do is take your public key, sign it with, it's actually not the, the private key from this key pair, but as I say, time's a bit quick. So we take this public key and private key, hash that, and that gives us the key. It also gives us an ID. So if the hash of this turned out to be, for instance, ABC, then we would, we would save that on the DHT at the however many K closest nodes. And it's, it's, again, it's in the open. Now, this ID, ABC, this user here now says, that's me. I am ABC. And he can, he can transmit information to other people and say, I'm ABC. I've signed this for you. And you can confirm that by going to the, the DHT and retrieving the value for the key, ABC, which will give you the public key, and you can confirm exactly who's speaking to you. So that's PKI without, without any servers and without you having to trust that I've sent you the public key and it's actually the real one. There's a, there's a really good video on Google by a guy called Van Jacobsen, New Way of Networking. And Van quite rightly puts a lot, of, uh, a lot of thought and feeling into the whole PKI. Knowing who's talking to you and why is very, very important. And today we don't, we don't actually have that ability. Some of us techie people can use a key server and whatnot, but your grant couldn't. So, that gives us the ability to sign information and validate that it's definitely come from us. Let me go slightly further. Maybe for time, okay. So we can log in, we can authenticate, we can guarantee that it's us. So we can start to look at things like uh, we can save data.
could message effectively. It's something we could do very easy, is share. I'm very interested in a sharing thing. So if you have your data atlas, which is basically your concatenated data maps, The data map is actually split into four sections. You've got metadata as well, obviously. And you decide that this information here is very interesting. It's about scalability or whatever. And you would like to share that with, uh, with someone, but you don't particularly want to share it with the whole world. If you take these data, data maps and send them to the person validated with PKI, then what you've done is you've just created a private share with no file servers and no authoritative control. And that, that I think is, that's one of the things I really like because researchers, there's, there's maybe 10 or 12 people researching every different type of cancer or whatnot. These guys need money and they need to be able to share information. Sharing information in this way, using the PKI uh, thing said, allows you to share information without servers immediately, without any cost, and also guaranteeing any IPR because you've, you've digitally signed your information. So that's, that's some, of the, some of the stuff the client can do. As I say, this, this generally takes four hours to get through this whole system. The nodes themselves, uh, as I say, it's a, it's a DHT network. So, so everyone's got their own own address. So we use 512 bit addressing because it ties in nicely with SHA 512 which is a great number. It's 1.3 times 10 to 154. So it's like 10,000 times Google squared. So on your PKI or on your distributed network you've, you've got, remember the internet, DHT and made safe layer. We store pointers to the bit of data. So on your DHT, this would say this key is where you store the data, which is the value. In the made safe layer, the value is pointers to where the data actually is. So your, your piece of data, A, B, C, you'll find the pointers to where the data is on the DHT. So they point into the main safe layer. And how main safe decides what to, where to store the information, each node has got availability checks and validity check. So, the validity check's easy, actually. We'll, we'll just do that first. So if you've got content and the name, which is your key, you know that the, the name of this piece of data is a hash of its content. So you've got three, three guys all with the same. We use replication. We don't use forward error correction of any kind. The idea of being perpetual data should be perpetual. If you use a, a three-way replication, this chap here can add some random data onto the end of the content, rehash it, and ask the partner node take, to take this random data, append it onto the content and rehash it, and give them back the answer. So that way, what we're doing, we're checking chunks of data all over the network without retransmitting because if this thing's got a virus in it or whatever, we may not want to transfer it about. So using the, the hashing technique, we actually can confirm whether data is valid or not. Obviously, three-way argument. So validity check is, is one thing. You lose points if you're not valid. The availability check. Sorry? The only way 
the only way to actually do it is if you have the piece of data it's, it itself and append the, the random information to it. If, if it's not the exact same piece of data, you'll never be able to answer it. Like, you know, the the yeah. So these guys never transmit the data. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. So another guy here, you mean? Oh, like so this guy intercepts this random challenge. Yeah. These these all have it. All right. Yeah. 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 All of all of these things are signed using the PKI thing. So this guy is C1, C2, C3. C1 asks C2 an assigned message. So even if it's if he passes that information on, it, it won't be from him. So the PKI thing is very it's very important for us. So the availability checks slightly different. Well, what we have here is each node has a rank. I'll put that up here actually. A ranking system. So as nodes come in and out of the network or whatever, there's super nodes. I'll just call them rank zero. Rank zero nodes, these, these could be rank three, rank two, rank one, or whatever. Lots of rank ones. And these, these guys actually get the ranking based on how often they're on. Now, the system starts with a couple of super nodes that we, we've defined. As it grows, these, these super nodes check every so often, left and right the other nodes in the network. So this guy here will be checked by this super node and this super node. So you, you actually end up with an overlapping database, which is quite interesting. Amazon do a, a really clever thing with this uh, on a Dynamo paper, which is very much worth reading. So the, the super nodes actually, they confirm this guy here is continually on in a in a time frame that would meet a rank two machine. As, a, as the rank decreases, the machine's more efficient. And it's really interesting in the, in the office because when we start the network off, eh, all the machines are rank four or five. And you see them growing, just like we people. And they, they grow to, to rank one status. The, the super nodes themselves are actually ranked one machines, which are promoted based on the number of nodes between them. And that's that's using Kademli, it's the XOR rather than Euclidean distance, it's the XOR distance. So this guy will never look at more than 500 nodes each side. This guy's the same. If they do, they'll pull a rank one up for a while. And it's totally indeterminate, it's very, you, you, you wouldn't be able to tell who's going to be rank zero, rank one. But this gives you a ranking system so that you know if you've got a a client which is one of those human guys and he has a node associated with him. There's a registration process which is slightly com complex but it's very anonymous. The client will attach himself to a node which he uses a, another randomly generated uh, key pair for called the made safe anonymous ID. There's about 20 IDs in the system, that's why it, it takes so long to go through. So. The node, when, when this client goes to store data, he can only store data with the rank of the node that he uses. So he'll, he'll store on rank two machines or whatever. But interestingly, as, yeah, this is something I should show you as well, really. The self-encryption 
if you remember, was a file that was encrypted with no user input. Which, of course, a lot of you will understand that means that if you've got certain chunks, A, B, C, D, E, F, from, I don't know, some Kyle Minogue MP3 file, and you go to save them, the chances are they're already saved. When they're already saved, you don't need to, to put them onto the network. You just keep your data, data map. Now we imagine with this duplicate uh, prevention that we could actually recover something like 95% of the disk space that's out there today. The other thing it does is if, you've got, if you're a rank two or three machine and someone else is saving the same file, they're a rank one machine, this will auto promote all of this data to rank one status. So the way the system works is you basically install, install the client and the node program on your own computer. And if you leave your own computer on and it's got good availability or whatever, your, your experience will be much better. You can actually buy rank one space, that's something that we're doing. We, just some old dirty disks on the network. If they fall over, if the if the disks fall over through the validity check or availability checking process, this guy goes away. These these will obviously automatically make a new copy. If that's fixed in time, you won't lose any any rank. So the system completely looks looks after itself and uh, has no as I say no authority whatsoever. So. Again, it's slightly different the way we look at this. We, we'll never, ever know our users. We never want to. Our users will, will be completely anonymous on, on the internet. There's the hash of the username plus pin for authentication is actually a very simplified version of what happens because we, we use at the same time time itself. So the hour of the day that someone's logged in is added to the username plus pin. So you've got a movable Username situation, the movable password situation. Brian. Yeah. Initially, what we are putting out is a because this is quite a radical change in the way computers work. We are putting out a system which will give you backup plus sharing, and it'll just look like a a normal program for the time being, just to build confidence in the, the network and allow it to take off. But we're also putting, when we get Fuse to work properly with Windows, it'll be really good, but we're putting a Fuse file system in place. So the intention with this system is, if you go to any computer, log in, it's completely your computer under your control. Log back out again and it's gone. So Eric Schmidt actually described it really well when he's caught this. Oh, sorry. The question was, what is the system going to look like? If the client's credentials are lost, if you forget your password, sorry. Can oh, you're going to pass this. Sorry again. Uh, what happens if the client credentials are lost or compromised because the data is perpetually available to everybody? If the client loses his credentials, he's lost all of his data completely. Uh, it's one of the problems that's, that we, we sometimes encounter when we're at talks. It's if you're buying a safe, you want a safe that's unbreakable and then lose the combination. That, that's what, the interesting thing here though is your username, pin and password, you, you need all three. You could actually give someone else your username, someone your PIN, someone your password. But we think with the Fuse thing, you're using it every day. We're also looking at biometric access here. The Fuse thing, we should be using this every day. And because you can generate as many IDs as you want, IDs can be linked to the ranking system to give a trust metric, for, especially for messaging. You could say, I'm not going to speak to anyone unless I've got a, a trust measurement of greater than 50%. You can, uh, yeah, because you can create so many IDs and you can share the information, you could share your whole data atlas with your wife, for instance, a, a 
whatever. So if you did lose a significant part of your credentials, you would be able to get your information. I have a question on performance. Yeah. Uh, since this is all being done on the fly. Yeah. Hey, do you have any metrics that you've looked at? Yeah, we've, uh, we do quite a lot of testing in the office. And the, this, the interesting thing about this is it's not really a theory. We, it's an alpha testing at the moment. And for a, a very low performance system at the moment, it takes one minute, uh, 20 seconds for a five meg file, so a music file or whatever. And that's, that's, that's increasing. As, as, more, as more people start using the system, it gets better because we do a, a caching thing very similar to Kademla cache. So if you ask for a piece of information, as the closer it gets to it, it's copied. It's as close to multicasting as we can get. So if someone else round about you asks for the same piece of information, the first hop in the route should give them it. So it won't come all the way back to the original three. So it gets quicker. So has this been tested on a specific hardware or operating system? I mean, are you talking about Google Big Table or Google File System? No, no. We, we just use it's Basically, at the moment, it's mostly written in Python and C++ for the encryption. Uh, we're, we're converting some of the Kademlia stuff to, to C, C++. But this is just running on commodity hardware using Windows or Linux. We've not tested it on Mac OS just, just yet. We don't use anything fancy. Just redesign the way computers work. Um, actually, I got a qu couple of questions. First of all, yeah. um, what's the minimal size of your anthill to be able to work? Two and a half thousand. Two and a half. Interestingly, uh, Deborah Gordon has, has a slide which shows an ant colony. This is 10,000 ants. It becomes very, very stable. We are, we're at two and a half thousand nodes. Prior to that, we have unknown because of binary tree balancing. So we're changing Kademlia quite a lot so that the, the K-Bucket implementation, we can tell the amount of nodes that are on it based on the XOR closeness of your, your own bucket. So we can actually work out, uh, don't go down 512 routes, it's far too much, that there's maybe only 64 or 128 people on it. So. Yeah, then the next question would be, how many ants are allowed to die at once without affecting the whole backup system? Three, we, in addition to standard Kademlia, we use a, use a, a location-based system. So that the four, the four practical copies of a, a rank one piece of data is spread across time zones. And we use, a, we use mod one, mod three type. As a, the K bucket splits, we, we use modulo division so that in each area we have a random number of uh, Kademli addresses and we can, we can shove this across time zones. So three continents at one time must go off and never come back on. And another one, um, he mentioned that if a user uses his credentials, basically you can't access his data anymore. That's Do you have it. some sort of cleanup procedure because that over time would create yeah. a su substantial overhead, I guess? Yeah, there is. There's a, there's a thing called, on the, the Kademla network, where you, where you store your key, which is maybe ABC, which will give you the pointers to, to where your data is. There's also an ABC watch list. So you, you actually hash the word ABC watch list, and that gives you the key. That gives you another key. And the values of this key are 50 people that are looking at that file. The, the watch list is a, uh, it's a pop process. The next person that's looking at the file will actually put itself into the watch list and take the 50th one off, so he'll become number one. The watch list itself dies out over, dies out over time. And the, the reason for this is so that we don't have malicious people coming on and saying, we all like the Kiley single, now delete it. We use a PKI signatures for deletion. But as a watch list empties, and this chunk is uh, no longer valid, everybody removes themselves from here. 
the watch list will check itself every 60 days, users every 45 days, and then that data can go. Ultimately, I believe that we don't want to get rid of any of the data. You know, the way hard drives are going, I think a hard drive today, in five years' time, the hard drive that you have will be able to store all the information that the internet has today which is an interesting thing from a scaling perspective, also from the processing perspective. Five years ago, a laptop today would be in the top 500 supercomputers, so we're definitely on this. We might be slightly ahead of the curve for this technology, but I think it's right. How do you prevent a malicious user from taking up significantly more resources than they're contributing? It's a quid pro quo network, so to actually save information. So if this is your, you here, and you're trying to store some information to the network, you say store one megabyte, and he says okay, you store one megabyte back. So it's a quid pro quo. To, to put information on, you must give something up. Is there, um, is there a risk of files that have any sort of dy um, dynamic content of having a outdated file at, an other, at the other edge of the network be given to a user as, as an update's occurring on the other edge? Yeah, there would be, I think, if we stuck to the Kademlia process because of the republish information, you can enter. A good thing with DHTs are really, really good at putting information on. They're, they're actually quite difficult to get it off at, at times. So your keys and your pointers, you can end up, if, you, if we just used the key value pair and stored the data at the value, it would replicate to the wrong places. But we actually overwrite, overwrite the values and they, they go around using a, we use certain modifications, a down, downlist modification. So we take care of stale data. But also the thing that you ask for, if the file's been updated, you're asking for, the host encryption hash. So when you, when you get that file, it's exactly what you asked for. It can't be any different. If someone else has updated a file, like you're both looking at the same chunks, this guy updates it and you're not part of a share, you'll keep getting the old one unless you've joined the share. I've only discussed private sharing here, but there's a, there's a mechanism where we can publicly share information. So you right click on a file, everyone has access to it. And that's searchable. So searchable public information is, is quite an interesting concept, I think, for Google. Continuing the previous question about malicious users using up too much resources, can you store a lot of data in the system and then just pretend to store stuff that they give you in return and not actually store it? Yeah, we look at this quite continually. The, the quid pro quo thing, you can only store on the same rank as yourself. So low rank machines, we don't really care too much. It doesn't sound very good, but we don't care too much. They're like the baby ants, you know, they might work, they might not, or whatever. But as your ranking improves, you know, so you, to build up to rank two, for instance, which may take six months at, at a certain activity level, if you store information and say, yeah, I'll, I'll take that back, we'll do the quick pro quo thing and then delete it all, your rank dra drops dramatically. So it's very difficult for someone malicious to do any damage. They actually only hurt themselves. But I think that's the way things should work. If, it's, if the design's logical, it, we didn't really plan for some of this stuff. It's just the logic of the design dictates that that works. Uh, I'm just wondering um, if you compare this to a server that has, to one server that has all information available and just clients accessing it, um, is there a certain data that can be stored on this which is better suited, um, say like specific to users? Or like do you see this just being used to store data specific to like a computer or can it be used to store data that's potentially one user has access to mm. at the same time 
data on several nodes. Uh, this could actually be, because you can basically take Kademlia and put it into a database, key value pair database. That's, that's a good way to think about it, actually. All of the information could be stored in one server, but the problem is someone owns it, and it, it's a single location. If I, if I was a kind of data thief or whatever, that's the kind of thing I, I would look for, single location. With this, what we, we started off with 160-bit key uh, address space, which is 2 to the 48. It's, a bit, it's equivalent to if you take all the grains of sand and all the beaches in the world and square them, that, that's, a, that's a 160 bit address space. And when we spoke to people about this, we said it's like taking your data and chopping it into pieces of sand and then putting it on the DHTs, like throwing that sand on beaches all over the world. So for someone to try and reverse the whole process, they have to go and get all the sand. If even if some of it's missing, your address space size has to be traversed. And then with that, try and calculate what bit went with what in what order and how many bits made up what file. So the, di the distribution is actually quite beneficial from that perspective. As I say, you can have continents going out. A, a whole continent can go off and your data should still be safe. The other thing that this does the nodes, the, if you remember, the protect the colonies, the, the primary thing. If, if the nodes find that they can't find nodes that they previously could, they all go into a fallback mode and create a new colony. So, for instance, if the, the Pacific connection went off or India went offline, I don't know how that would happen, but if they did, the Indian subcontinent would actually form a new made safe network and then rejoin at a later stage. So. I'm just thinking, in terms of like the one server, if it's available, say you can access basically anything at once. Uh -huh. Is there a worst case and best case for a sim like similar situation with your system? Say like you needed, like I need data that's oh, yeah. here, here, here. Yeah. So data that's that's particularly interesting and maybe busy. That's a I think I understand. I may have this wrong. But on the on the network, if you've got someone in the US and China was here, and CNN did a really good story about China, because of the caching, that, that information may have been held here, here, and here as the theoretical thing. As these guys start asking about it, the information will start making its way over. So these guys will get information that's closer to them. So you remove the, the, the latency involved with going, going all the way here. And as I say, that is the closest to multicasting. If you had one single server with all the information on it, obviously you're, wherever you're, if you were right next door to it, it'd be great. And if you're at the other side of the world, it'd be slightly slower. Easier to maintain, I would say. But again, it's it's massive security. Who who would we give this server to? The, in terms of the, the technology is quite interesting here, I think. But the company structure is also very interesting because it, all of this, as I say, will be free of charge, and there's a charity who will own more than seventy five percent of the company, so. That charity will be run by everyone. Every everyone who has a node will have a vote in how the system works. So it's really for the people. Thanks. Uh, so maybe I missed this, but does data placement change depending on the access patterns? For example, if I access my files from here and then I move to China, yep. will my data eventually change? And how does that work? It uses. Uh, you're, you're correct, it, it does do that. We use caching. Uh, if, you, if you look at the look at the globe and say we just take it in time zones, if you were on time zone zero when we were back in Scotland, we generally are, your data would be stored in time zone zero plus eight and minus eight as a minimum. Then other other people might come in in time zone four, so they look for data to be moved. There could be an additional copy there. But as data is accessed, the, the caching 
the caching mechanism means that it will fall, flow through the route. So if you ask 10 people and you eventually get to the data, it will be stored in those 10 locations. Those 10 locations will store it for a period of time, which is, is calculated through a, an algorithm. But they will give it to two other people. So you, you get this sort of binary tree of, it means if you get a, a really popular story, you don't get the kind of slash dot effect that the whole network takes care of it. And then after that time period's up, it goes away again. We're going to take one more question. Is it possible to do computation within the network? It's uh, possible to do computation. It's quite interesting because one of the things, there's, there's two ways that this, this project will go, and it will go both of them. One is the dynamo type thing where you've got not completely random data, but pseudo, pseudo random data, database reads with very few writes. You can actually do that with the dynamo system. And we have got a dtuple implementation on top of Kademli as well, which we're, we're looking at. So that's a very early, very early stages, but you, you will be able to do computation using dtuple. Also, the nodes using a traditional distributed uh, platform like SETI or Rosetta is, is something we're very keen on. And that's, again, that leads to the, the desire for research to, to progress quickly. So strictly sharing information in, in a way you can save IPR plus giving resources to different projects. I think is a, is a very good thing for us to do. Okay. Thank you so much, David. No problem.